You're listening to Five Things with Lisa Birnbach. Hi, it's Lisa Birnbach on a very momentous week, one of many very momentous weeks. And my guest today is James Ponowazic. He is the chief TV critic for The New York Times and the author of a new book called Audience of One, Donald Trump Television and the Fracturing of America. Welcome to the broadcast, Jim. Uh, thanks for having me, Lisa. I have been reading your your criticism for a long time, your reviews for a long time. I really appreciate your take on things after an award show, after a big sporting event, after a debate. But I have to say that your thesis that basically TV created Donald Trump and the media created Donald Trump made me ashamed of myself because I sort of am one of those people who's written about him and and thought about him too much. I you know no, nobody's hands clean on that one. <laughs> you know really that that was that was that was a work of 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 many authors. Um, but yeah, you know that, that's. Donald Trump was a a media figure before he was anything, right? He was somebody who, like you know, as you know, made himself a tabloid fixture in New York before he'd really done anything in the in the real estate business. And he was and in a way a brand by doing that. Yes, in a way, he was famous for being famous before Paris Hilton and her ilk. Yeah, he was. He was. He was Kim Kardashian before she was Kim Kardashian. Uh, yeah, and, and it was it was the same principle, that same understanding. That you know, appearance is reality in a heavily mediated society, and on its most basic level, you know that was like calling up the page six columnists at the New York Post, and you know who understood that he would give you dirt and you could say anything you wanted about him as long as he called him a billionaire. Right, he was not a billionaire at the time. If, if he has ever been if since, he has ever been. Uh, we yes. have no way of verifying this. Right, uh, uh, but but you know that was the thing. You get your name next to the word billionaire soon enough that is close enough to reality for most people's purposes. And that's kind of a, you know, that's a principle of television. It's it's a principle of, of media branding. And it was it, the basis of every facet and stage of his career. And it's proximity to truth was never a priority. Yeah. You know, seeming, you know, for one thing, he was able to do this partly because he sort of, you know, rose and burnished his reputation in arenas where it didn't matter that word. Nobody asked, you know, too, too much. Again, going back to, you know, coming up through the tabloids in New York. Nobody was like sitting down and like asking to look at his books and, you know, <laughs> determine right. whether he's an actual billionaire. Oh, right. if it, you know, it's, it's, you know, if, if it's a good enough story, you run with it, you know, in reality TV years later. If you look like a rich guy, then you are a rich guy. If you look like a successful businessman on TV, then you're a successful businessman. And, and it's, it, it is sort of this, you know, idea of he developed this national image as people's, you know, visual cartoon image manifestation of ridiculous wealth in all these venues in which it didn't really matter that much. It was kind of a joke. It was kind of entertainment until it wasn't a joke and wasn't entertainment anymore. We'll be right back with James Ponowazic after this. So we talk about Donald Trump, you and I, and I talk about Donald Trump with everyone. He has burnished himself. He has wormed his way into my brain, Jim. It it pisses me off because he's not that... I don't think he's that smart. We could argue about that. Some people think he's he's dumb like a fox or whatever that expression is or clever like a, <laughs> a pig. I don't know. Yeah. But, but that he really, underneath it all even though he doesn't know where Kansas City is and he doesn't know where a storm was and he doesn't know where the Ukraine is and he's never read the Constitution. Yeah, he's really smart and he's a great salesman. We could say that, but how he has been able to infect us all, that's a whole other question. How do you think that happened? 
Um, I mean, it was a gradual process. You know, I think that whether you want to call it, you know, genius or instinct or, or whatever, he has always had that, you know, just sort of that, that intuition um, for the, you know, kind of eliciting a lizard brain response in people, whether it's, you know, outrage, whether it's in the 80s getting in, you know, a, a public insult match in the press with Ed Koch, uh, whether, you know, or, Rosie or, O'Donnell. Or, yes, or getting yeah. in, getting into it with Rosie O'Donnell, you know, yeah. this, this notion of, you know, knowing the buttons to push in whatever audience it's in front of and understanding that there's no such thing as, as, as bad attention, um, you know, the ability to get inside your head you know, you can call that smart or not, but it's it's a definite ability. You know, obviously, people people think of him all the time now because he is the president of us. You know, and that's and and he is a president who does not place a value on sort of receding into the background or you know presenting gravitas and you know being a stabilizing figure. His impulse as president, as much as it was when he was, you know, getting in 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 wars in the tabloids in the 1980s and going was, bankrupt was always to get a ten- always to inflame a controversy or a fight rather than to smooth it over. Um, and, well, and 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 so you know that that's that's naturally going to worm its its way into people's heads more. I mean, I always thought about Obama, but I didn't always think about what was going on in the world because I felt that as president and with his cabinet and with all of the checks and balances and branches of government, we were in good shape. Now I have this terrible, sick feeling, and it's and it's unhealthy because I'm just one one resistor, I feel like if I'm not paying attention to what's going on, it's going to get even worse. But it gets worse every day. And there's nothing I can do about it other than give money to candidates who are running against Mitch McConnell and Susan Collins and so on, and write and talk and and call Congress people. Yeah. I mean, people, you know, called Barack Obama, no drama Obama, right? Right, right. <laughs> like that was that was sort of an an ethos of life with him. Nobody would attach the the adjective no drama to Donald Trump. He's he is the opposite of that. Right. You know, sort of you know, getting to the subject of, of you know, my 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 book, for instance, uh, you know, Obama famously said he tried to ignore the electronic media and cable news as much as possible because he said, you know, um it just you just get bogged down in all the noise and you don't really learn anything from well avoiding the noise that's as much the antithesis of donald trump as as anything in the world well, like as- donald trump just runs on the principle of always turn up the volume right. always accentuate the conflict never let pe- and, and this thing that is you know dispiriting or sick making to you or whatever is you know uh, really energizing to a lot of his followers for whom, you know, the the proposition, the, the thing that they get out of him is he's going to make the people that you don't like feel bad all the time. <laughs> right. Like that's right. That, it's that like politics as like, you know, an, an it's a affective. Wrestling. Yeah. Yeah. And, and like affective politics. Right. Like right. like politics is less about. I'm going to get, you're going to do a thing for me. I'm going to get a tangible benefit and more like you're going to give me these emotions that I thrive on. And that's obviously that's not everybody that follows Donald Trump. There are, you know, the people who they would have been just as happy to have Jeb Bush and they just want their tax cuts and they'll put up with this, et cetera, right. et, cetera et cetera. But, you know, for 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 a lot of, you know, people who are his sort of intense rally going followers, that same feeling that registers as dread or whatever when you look at your phone in the morning is like adrenaline. To, and, and it certainly is. To, to him. him. That's the principle that he operates on. And it's the principle, like, basically of TV and the media. Like, if a TV camera could think, that's what it would think like. I always want another thing. Give me something to be excited about, you know? Yes. Like a child, an insatiable child. Yeah. But but then there are people, this is what I don't understand, the people who like him, uh, let's say they're aware that he doesn't actually do the quote unquote work of presidenting. He goes and gives himself rallies all the time from the first first month of being president, where he lied about the size of his in- inaugural crowd, to now, and he watches a lot of TV and tweets. 
we didn't we used to like as a country, didn't we respect the presidents who actually worked diplomatically, met with other world leaders, uh, uh, lobbied Congress for bills, uh, uh, did the sort of day-to-day work of running the country. Didn't we think that was something admirable once? Um, sure. And I mean, you know, there's there's a big part of the electorate for whom that that still does matter a lot. And they tend to not be the people so much who voted for 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 Donald Trump. And, you know, arguably there were flaws in that idea of the president that like, you know, you were supposed to be, um, you know, an expert on doing everything who had a tremendous amount of knowledge. And you know, the fact is that, you know, often presidents who were like that were, you know, kind of micromanagers and tend to get bogged down in details. And, you know, there's always been that thing of presidents of like, are you like a big picture idea guy or are you uh, get your hands and everything guy? But <laughs> yeah, you're right. Like, I think the way I've kind of thought about it, you know, sort of through the frame of, of Trump as, as, as a, a essentially media creature is in other systems of government, like in the United Kingdom, you're used to the idea of having a head of state and a head of government, Right. Um, and we don't have that in, you know, the United States, but, you know, there's the concept there that, you know, there is there is the queen, the king, whatever, who does these royal functions, who does these symbolic and right. emotive things that make the nation feel a certain way about itself. And then there is the prime minister who is this bureaucrat, head of a poli- politician who like actually does trade deals and all that. Well, you know, now you could say that you know, maybe we're moving into an era where not all of our presidents, but some will be more along the line of their sort of. A, a celebrity head of state. In other words, their job is rallies, it's delivering emotions, it is, you know, dunking on their opponents and, you know, doing all those things that make you feel those endorphins. And somebody else, Mike Pence, Mitch McConnell, whoever it happens to be under, you know, the president, actually does all the stuff getting done part of it. Well, yeah, I guess that's right. I guess that's why um, the United States in 2020 resembles the Hunger Games in so many ways. Um, yeah, I mean, President Snow dist- was probably more hands on. I would yeah. say. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. But, yeah. Um, I mean, really, President Trump is sort of his own Caesar Flickerman, you know, if you're using yes, the Hunger Games analogy. Exactly, exactly. It it terrifies me. It honestly terrifies me. But the funny thing, or one of the many, many funny, hypocritical, crazy things, ironic things about what's going on, is that the man who became more famous for saying, you're fired, hasn't been able to fire anyone. And instead, his cabinet has turned over many times. He can't keep a staff. He can't keep a chief of staff. And those who leave very often find themselves in prison. But yet he can't say you're fired. At one point, didn't he have his driver fire his chief of staff. I think his driver or body man fired Rens Priebus or something I th- I like think that. that. That may be right. And I think he delegated some of this stuff to other chiefs of staff during mm-hmm. his administration. I mean, yeah, he's, he's very much, he's always been about the idea of conflict and the idea of belligerence and decisiveness. Um, but in actual life has always tended to be kind of conflict averse in in that way. And as I noticed writing about him in the 90s and being an editor at Spy Magazine in the 80s, he for a public figure, he certainly is thin-skinned. Yeah, and pays a great deal of attention to his a media clips. A great class. deal of I don't, attention. I don't know if you ever had the pleasure of getting a sharpied up copy of your one of, one of your uh, piece I, from Spy or anything like that, but... Uh, well, he still sends pictures of his hands to Graydon Carter and says, see, not so small. Yeah. <laughs> he does <laughs> yeah. with a sharpie. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, this is, this is one of the many paradoxes of Trump, right? Is, is that... One of one of one of one of his big appeals to his followers is, you know, he goes to war with the media and he hates the media. He doesn't care what any of those elites say about him. (laughs) He totally cares. Right. He totally cares. He totally cares. Anybody says about it. And, And this has been true again. Like this is not simply a political statement about President Trump. This is something that it would have been absolutely uncontroversial to say about Donald Trump 10 years ago. Anybody who knew anything about him as a businessman, a Manhattan gadfly, a reality TV celebrity. A womanizer. He was was hugely, uh, you know, he was hugely obsessed 
with his media presentation, Mm -hmm. with his clips. He was, you know, the the he's like the quintessential actor who says he never reads the reviews. Right. Always reads the reviews or has them memorized. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, He used to there's there's a story. This is not, you know, my discovery, but it's it's from one of his biographies that that I cite in my book. Uh, that um, back in the day, like the 80s, 90s, in the VCR era, uh, his assistant at Trump Tower used to keep a file of VHS tapes. There was like a closet of VHS tapes of his TV appearances that he would just kind of pull out and watch sometimes when he just needed a pick-me-up, just needed a little (laughs) ego boost. (laughs) Well, when I wrote my article for New York Magazine about Mar-a-Lago, I got a call from Norma, his long time, you know, she had the thankless job of being his assistant. And she said, Lisa, we had thought you were a nice girl. (laughs) So, and if you ever read the story, you'll see I was as neutral as possible, but I didn't say this is the best house with the best people. I just was neutral. And that made me a bad person. Fox News will of course, have to take a great deal of the responsibility for electing Donald Trump. And I'm aware, and speaking as a non-Fox watcher, I'm aware of people who, having not strong political leanings one way or another, for some reason, because someone in their household or office had Fox News on all the time, they eventually became I don't want to call it brainwashed, but they became Fox people. Mm -hmm. And their points of view have gone done a 180. And they really, for no discernible reason in their life, as in losing a job to someone or, I don't know, just hating liberals, have become Fox Republicans. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about what Fox has done so brilliantly to bring everybody along. And again, in a time of such tremendous income inequality, that people should love the rich image of Trump and Hannity and O'Reilly and and bullies. What do you make of that? Um, You know, one thing is this this phenomenon that that you cite is is that, you know, after 20 odd years of Fox, we've had basically the the radicalization of conservative old people. Uh, through Fox News exposure. And I, I say that, you know, not to be ageist, but simply, you know, as, as somebody who writes about television, TV critics, cable news audiences just demographically skew very, very, you know, that that is large. It's largely, you know, like older retired people who have a very strong interest in news and political news and will spend hours and hours a day watching cable. And in Fox, it is obviously this, you know, echo chamber of opinion and uh, "Quote unquote straight news that kind of plays into the same themes that Hannity or whoever is talking about at, uh, at night." But you know, I will say that Fox. You know, I don't think that Fox necessarily set out. Uh, you know, in in Roger Ailes' grand scheme to like create a a Donald Trump, and I I mean this in the sense that in a way, part of what Donald Trump did was steal Fox's audience from it. Right. Mm-hmm. Like like he became a Fox personality and tapped into this red meat craving base that they created and was able to feed them red meat better than John McCain and Mitt Romney. And they basically imprinted on him more than 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 Fox News. So it's like uh, Fox News. kind of you, you know what I mean? Like, uh, right. Rich, John Kasich didn't become the face of Fox News. Yeah. Right. Mitt Romney needed Fox News to access the Fox News audience. And now Fox News basically needs to access its audience through Donald, Donald Trump. Trump. But what you know, but what Fox News did do is you know they they created, they cultivated this um, very you know insular conservative audience over a, a literally a generation or more that was really responsive to a politician like um, you know a, a Donald Trump who you know sort of instinctively had again had that instinct for button pushing and culture warring. And was willing to be, you know, really audacious and shameless in in appealing to them and go to places like birtherism that, you know, quote unquote, respectable politicians would. And, and he was able to do that in a way that, you know, he couldn't have credibly, reasonably done, say, in the 1980s, because starting in 1986, right, Roger Ailes founds this cable news network whose basic principle is 
but beyond conservatism, it's grievance. Mm-hmm. All the mm-hmm. elitists look down at you. We're and we're and, right. And you can only trust us, right? And you you sort of cleave them off from the rest of the media environment, and then that's abetted by you know, uh, Presidential Medal of Freedom recipient Rush Limbaugh, and then mm. that 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 whole industry, uh, you know, where it's basically you know, you can access reality through us, and you should trust only us. And that makes a, a tremendously for a tremendously anxious and loyal audience, which is just waiting to be scooped up by the right politician. It really is a, a scenario that 25 years ago, even though, according to your book, this was starting, this had started with Donald Trump, but it's a scenario that really comes out of a dystopian novel. It yeah. it would be hard to come up with any other figure. It's like the kryptonite of Fox merged with the orange skin of Donald Trump, <laughs> and it became a magical poison. Yeah. Um, no, over and over again when I was writing, you know, I, I, I greatly, in, in a way, I, I, I kept feeling like science fiction or dystopian fiction or fantasy was the best way to to write about this and analogize it because in a way you're sort of writing about when you're writing about the media and people's emotions and this sort of virtual world that television creates you're really kind of writing about like a kind of magic in the sense that you're writing about something intangible that operates inside people's head and makes them feel you know great passions that that they then act out in the actual physical world and yeah, you know, there are so many analogies. I don't know if you watch Black Mirror. I've uh, seen some on yeah. Netflix, uh-huh. and, and it was on British television before that. And there's this uh, 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 prescient episode of it called uh, the the Waldo Moment. I believe it's the Waldo Moment, which is about this um, sort of uh, obnoxious, un PC, truth telling cartoon character that hosts this like offensive talk show uh-huh. and runs for office as a gag and wins and wins uh-huh. and ultimately like becomes you know the, the 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 tyrant of the world by sort of a you know pushing people's buttons and you know saying the thing that you're not supposed to say and kind of operating in this world between seriousness and parody, you know, which is, and I write about this a lot in the book from David Letterman to like his media appearances to reality TV. Donald Trump has always thrived in these appearance, these, these, these environments where it's like, I'm joking, but I'm not joking. I mean it, but I don't mean it. You know, professional right. wrestling where he's right. WWE Hall of Fame member, Tr- Donald Trump. Um, and in many ways, uh, it's you know, his President pre- Zelensky his- Come on, yes. it's it's yeah. it's a very good parallel. Yeah, and and, and it, in many ways, yes, yeah, presidency is the application of that. You know, I'm 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 joking, I'm joking, unless you want me to be serious. You right, know? right, yeah. right. Oh, there's so much to talk about, but I do because it is Oscar weekend. I also want to talk to you about totally. other TV things yeah. that are within your purview. What's your take? And we've had a few, and we will have one this weekend of a hostless award show. Do you think it's more efficient? Do you think it's sort of cleaner? Nobody has a problem. Nobody, no, no host means no host whoever tweeted anything tasteless is is a problem. Yeah, I don't necessarily care about, you know, the skeletons in a particular person's closet or, I mean, you know, that's, that's sort of, I mean, obviously they're, you know, People who probably should not be hosting the Oscars, and and you know that's 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 sort of a casting issue for the Academy. I think one one problem for the Academy in 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 you know that they ran into with the the the, the Kevin Hart thing is that they they have there's a very small category of people who are willing to host the Oscars and are not going to get dragged on Twitter for being chosen to host the Oscars, and who the Academy considers famous enough or has enough stature to host the Oscars, right? Because there are plenty of people who would be great hosts. You know, I'm sure who they just, you know, they probably would not feel... Tina Fey and Amy Poehler, who did a great job with the Golden Globes. Oh, they're, you know, they're they're TV people. Right, they're maybe, you know, right. not up to their... Uh, uh, so, but having said all that... I actually like the hostless Oscars last year. Honestly, we kind of obsess over the hosts of these shows. 
Um, a host nowadays, you know, t- isn't really so much of an MC anymore in these big productions. They do a monologue. They kind of disappear for a couple of hours in the, in the middle of there. And, you know, I, I actually thought, you know, they, they put on a pretty good show last year. And uh, really, whether the, the Oscars are good or not ends up depending on a lot of things, you know, besides the host anyway. So I'm, I'm fine with that. It's not something I feel passionately about one way or another. But uh, When people talk now about the golden age of TV which I think we're in. We're in one. Remember when there were was no scripted TV because of the writer's strike, and now scripted television is is kind of epic, don't you think? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I think I'm always I'm always loath to identify like particular, you know, golden ages of TV or whatever. The you know fifties, seventies, the you know Sopranos era or whatever. You know, I just think it's it's you know it's just it's kind of math in a way. There's so much television now. There's so many outlets that there are more opportunities for, you know, doing more unusual risk taking things that you couldn't have done in an earlier era of TV. And therefore, you know, just kind of the math of it is that there are, you know, many more fascinating and richly creative and different and therefore interesting perspectives than, than there used to be. So, you know, there are not many earlier times that I'd want to be watching TV than there is now. It's not like people are any more creative now than they used to be. Or, or right. Not, but There's just so much of it. Yeah, and, and and more people have outlets. You know, and there are people who are getting to make shows who might not have gotten to make shows before. And how many hours a week do you watch? Yeah, you know what? It's it, I don't have a great answer for that, except that I always feel it's it's often a lot more or a lot less than people would think. Which is to say, if I'm in a slow week. I could be, you know, watching screeners of upcoming things for, you know, 10 hours a day or something like that to catch up. If it's something like, you know, say we're, if I'm doing a lot of writing, um, I may be watching less TV than like the average person with a job out there, you know, simply <laughs> because, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm writing and, and closing things and so on. So I, I'm always feeling, you know, getting back to that peak TV thing, like I should be watching more than I am. You know, the, the, the job... I like to say now it's it's become more like being a book critic where, you know, you just you have to accept that you will never be able to watch more than a bare fraction of everything that's out there. Right. So you have to do like a lot more triage and kind of find what's interesting and sift through things. Right. Right. Um, the the more content, what's interesting to me, and I'm a real amateur because I never used to be a big TV watcher, is that with all these different outlets, the quality seems to be pretty high. You know, I'm I'm surprised by how many shows I hear about that I'm not watching. And then when I finally pick one and and commit to it, you know, they're usually pretty good. I haven't quit a lot of shows lately. Yeah, I, I will say one thing that and maybe this is probably a high class problem to have. But I think that, you know, we, we do face in, in this era of streaming and and you know all this this talent going into tv mm. there is there's kind of a glut of the like just good enough show that you know maybe isn't really spectacular or you know rough edged but great but you know things like you know a lot of netflix's dramas that you know you're never going to consider them groundbreaking but it's good enough to watch the whole thing in a way <laughs> it's going to sound like weird to say as a TV critic, I find myself like starting and then dropping a lot of things like that because I know it's just not going to be interesting enough to write about. Right. And when I it's rarer now that I encounter just a truly terrible show that that, <laughs> that gets made, you know, um, not to pick on one, but this is just the most well, recent you know yeah. example I can think of was uh, when when, when uh, Apple TV launched its lineup. And, and there was this this show uh, called uh, C, I believe about this future dystopian post-apocalyptic world in which everyone was blind. That was just like mystery science theater 3000 level of bad. And, you know, <laughs> I can't say that, you know, I watched the whole season or wanted to, but there's the part of me that's kind of like, man, I just, I kind of admire that something like this can like still get made now. You know, <laughs> my head is off to you. Yeah. And yeah. somebody, some, I will say somebody out there, like that's their favorite show and God bless them. Yeah, right. Right, right. Do you have a show that you find yourself sort of promoting to your friends beyond what you've written in the Times? 
Um, I mean, they probably tend to be shows that um, I've, you know, written about in one way or another. I think that the shows that I end up evangelizing for a lot is people often don't take really good animation seriously enough. Mm -hmm. Um, And some of the best shows on TV any given years are are animation. So BoJack Horseman was just ended. I think it's finally reached the level of respectability that people have a sense that it's a good show. But I still like, you know, tell people, no, you don't understand. This is like the best show on television now. You really need to be watching it. Uh, There is a uh, this sort of surrealistic a uh, comedy drama from one of the producers of BoJack Horseman called Undone on Amazon mm-hmm. that started last year. That was this this beautiful rotoscoped animation show that I highly recommend. And Infinity Train, uh, this cartoon for for tweens, but is also like just brilliant for adults. Uh, on Cartoon Network that just aired its second season is another one I'm big on. And, and it's like, I feel those are the sort of things that, like even in this era of peak TV, you still kind of have to evangelize the idea that, you know, you no know, animation can really be smart uh, and just as worthy as live action television and often better because, you know, it's it's untethered from physical reality, and, mm-hmm. you know, so mm-hmm. those are a few. Well, it's few. interesting, I mean, because graphic novels have certainly gotten their due in the last few years, yeah. too. No longer called comics. <laughs> right. The, but they they, they, just, they had to go through that period of like 20 years where every article on them was, you know, they're not just for kids anymore. And <laughs> Poor Art Spiegelman. They, I was going to say when Mouse yeah. came out, that was yeah. like, that's what it was like. And I'm sure, you know, he had, you know, a thousand clips at that time was, exactly if you th- you know, this isn't for your kids <laughs> unless you want your kids to learn about the holocaust at a tender age at a tender yeah. age right exactly one last thing before we go to your um list jim and that is hate watching versus not hate watching it's funny to me in this age of everybody knowing everything about everyone that some people are very clear that they're hate watching a show as opposed to earnestly watching a show. Yeah. I'm sure a lot of people write to you with that in mind, you know, how dare you recommend this show? I hate watch it or whatever. I find that I sort of hate watch the news now, too, which sure. is probably not too healthy. What do you make of hate watching? It's still the same number of calories as regular watching. Yeah, I don't totally get it. But, you know, I also come at it from the standpoint of somebody who watches TV for a living and just never feels that I have enough time to do my job properly as mm-hmm. it is. Mm-hmm. So it's like why spend, you know, your limited amount of time on Earth <laughs> watching, th- you know. But, but you know, if, if I try to get myself to understand it, I think it's it's often... You know, TV, as much as it is, you know, an isolated in your living room experience can also be a social thing. Uh, You know, either you're watching something together with your roommate or a significant other or whatever. And and, uh, or, uh, you know, like social media and things like Twitter have have enabled this kind of like watching and reacting to a thing together at the same time, which I think has been a big boon for, you know, I think a lot of people hate watch The Bachelor or reality right. shows like that and they're, because it they're, is this kind of communal experience. Oh, yeah. There are certain shows. I mean, Game of Thrones, I never got to. So on those nights, I just put my Twitter away because, you know, people were watching it in a mass. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, Twitter would become an all thrones all the time. Zone. Right. I mean, that was, I will say, that was, I'm kind of a fantasy buff to begin with, and it was it was definitely up my alley. Uh, but it had to be suffocating at some times, <laughs> just in the cultural discussion, if yes. that was not really your thing. Yes, and you're right. I've seen Bachelor live tweets, and, you know, of course, all the politics is is being live tweeted all the time yeah because it's it's all kind of a form of shocking live tv theater do you find the uh impeachment hearings to be good tv or bad tv um i don't know that they're you know good tv in the sense of being entertaining and they if they probably shouldn't be uh you know i would like to think even as somebody who writes about politics as theater and thinks that the the performative aspect of politics is important. I would like to think that there are still aspects in public life in which, you know, putting on a show with lots of thoughts of pizzazz is like <laughs> not, you know, not uh, the, the point. Yeah, it's <laughs> not not the, you know, the the entire point. 
in a way, I almost I almost likened especially the you know, it's like the house manager's arguments. And, and, and there were, I will say, some very gripping moments, certainly, uh, in the process. But if you're watching it all day, as, as I was, because I was writing about, which is not necessarily a, a healthy process, you realize that this is not really a production that's meant to be watched all day. You know what I mean? Like, like well, it's there quite are repetitive. Parts. Right. Right. And, and, and I think it's the idea, like the same idea behind, you know, a day of CNN, which is also, you know, while maybe worthy in some ways, not the healthiest thing to spend eight hours a day watching is that it's made with the idea that your viewers are going to be watching maybe an hour or a half hour at some point. And, and, you know, so in that sense, (laughs) quote unquote, good TV that, you know, had like a, you know, extended arc (laughs) <laughs> and, you know, beginning and end of right. construction wouldn't really work because how many people were going to be, be watching it that way? Right, right. Just just a few of us. I have a million more questions for you, Jim. I am really happy that you came to talk to us. I think you're a fascinating guy. Your book, Audience of One, is really smart and really parses Donald Trump as a television phenomenon, both as a consumer and as a user, and uh. in such interesting ways that, you, as again, if you're in the media or if you pay attention to the media, you suddenly start nodding while you're reading the book and, th- oh, yeah, we did that. We did that. Yep. We absolutely you, did that. You built that. <laughs> yeah, we did. We did. So tell us what your five things are that make your life better. Yeah, I loved this exercise, by the way. Great. That, that is, uh, and, and I would say- It's I was, hard, right? I, and I was talking about this with my wife and one of my kids at dinner the other day, and they were so- uh, it, it engrossed by it that they grabbed a piece of paper and started <laughs> writing down their their own. And it's it's hard like narrowing it down, right? And I think like it's going to be a thing that we just do every every week now. Is this you know oh, like, like very cool? It's kind of a fun thing. Y- yeah. But yeah. So should I do I just go down? Yeah. The list? Let's go down the list. Yeah. And we're actually going to play a bell with each one of your things. Okay. Okay. Number one. Number one. Uh, my my digital kitchen scale. Um. It was hard for me not to just make every item on this list a cooking thing because ah. I, I I love cooking. I'm obsessed. If, if I were retired, I would probably cook all the time. Wow. And there are so many little things that, you know, a good, you know, cast iron pan, uh, you know, my Instant Pot that, you know, like make life a lot better. Um, but the, 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 the kitchen scale, I just think, is a great, useful, cheap addition to your kitchen that more and more people should use. I, I, I am kind of uh, an, a, a fanatic about the idea that more recipes should include measurement units the way that a lot of European recipes do. Mm-hmm. Um, but I just, I use it for everything. I measure out my coffee in the morning with it. I just like the precision and the sense wow. of like science that it, you know, kind of brings to it. Now, wait, when you, when, when a recipe in America says half a cup, it's easier to measure it in a cup shaped thing than on a scale, right? Or do no. you do both? But, but you, you, you put a bowl on the scale. And you tear it, you know, you set it to zero. Right. And then you, if it's uh, 150 grams, you, you fill it up to 150 grams. That's what, that, that's what, you know, I, because for one thing, when, you know, a lot of people measure out a cup of flour, some people pat it down, some people, uh, uh, you know, do it like they're getting actually different amounts of flour right, right. Ba- based on the way they're measuring it. But often if you see, and again, particularly in European recipes, it will be uh, 150 grams of flour, you know, right. 50, 50 grams of turbinado sugar or, or, right. or whatever. And so I have recipes that, you know, I make waffles every weekend and I have a me- recipe that I've just committed to memory that I just put a big bowl on the scale. And I do, depending on like the the amount of the recipe I'm making, I do five ounces of flour, 0.4 ounces of sugar, you know, so much instant yeast Mm -hmm. and and so on. And so you're just, you're not using the cup. No, it it allows you to like use like, you know, just regular kitchen objects on top of your scale and then just measure things into there. Note to self. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I will say it is, it is, it is a huge thing. People sort of treat it like this weird, fancy extravagance, but I paid like twenty bucks for it. You know, it's plastic. You can find them, and it anywhere. works, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay, that's excellent. Number two. Number two, TiVo. What? So, you know, as a TV critic, I've actually done exercises like this before. 
Um, in at the New York Times, we have this feature called like tech I'm using, where they they uh, ask me about it, and I think people always expect that I'm going to you know have access to or use all this fancy TV technology. You know, my my setup is as basic as anybody else's there aren't really you know there aren't that many souped up elon musk has not made anything to revolutionize <laughs> the tv experience <laughs> yeah uh you know so, so for the times i actually talked about my sous vide wand uh you know getting back to the kitchen <laughs> right. but tivo the dvr it's been around exactly as long as i've been a tv critic and i kind of can't imagine how i would have been a tv critic back in the caveman days when you had to record things on you know cassette tapes or not at all couldn't rewind things i'm often a terrible note taker and i really rely on being able to like rewind and get quotes correctly Mm -hmm. um and it's still the best we're we're now to the point with tivo where like a lot of people have dvrs but if you talk about actually using a tivo it's like okay grandpa but like i actually use a tivo brand tivo i still think it's it's the the best interface for the professional. <laughs> that is, that, I, I think we have a TiVo at home, so I'm going to mark that down, too, is to to look for it and try it out, because I cannot figure out the DVR at yeah. all. Number three, I have never heard of this. Oh, March Mammal Madness. Do yourself a favor. This is the perfect time of year to get ready for it. Um, this is this is my my favorite end of winter ritual. What it is is a competition every March that was organized a few years ago by this group of uh, academics, mammologists, animal scientists, um, that as sort of a, a educational slash entertainment project where they create a bracket, sixty four team <laughs> roughly bracket every year right. of different. I think it was originally mammals. Now they've kind of gotten liberal with the the categorizations, and there will be reptiles and amphibians and birds and stuff like that. But uh, uh, organized along the principle of, <laughs> you know, just the classic principle of who would win in a fight. Seriously? Uh, yeah, it, seriously. And then they, they will, they'll, they'll organize, you'll pick your bracket the way that people who follow sports, unlike me, you know, do NCAA brackets. I actually, I sometimes will do an NCAA bracket, but really badly. Uh, uh-huh. And you fill out your bracket and then on Twitter, on various nights throughout March, they narrate the battles between, you know, whatever, the ocelot and the panda or whatnot. It's incredibly entertaining. And it's a virtual and low battle, fi. It's, right? It's, it's it's a virtual bit. Yes, they no, don't put no two animals, animals in a pit. <laughs> yeah, in a pit of jello. Uh, yeah, and you know sometimes it will be you know there will actually there will end up being no fisticuffs. It will be you know some animal will will wander off <laughs> and it's considered like dislodged from its location and the other animal wins. And and it is you know it is all based. With citations and everything in actual science of here's how these animals interact in their environment and what they might do if they encounter each other. And, wow. so, and it's incredibly. And so just Google March Mammal Madness and have some fun and, and do it. Oh, cool. I will. And we're going to put the link up uh, with with uh, this week's blog and podcast. Number four. Uh, Bob's Burgers. Oh, my kids. Lo- you know, you and my exhibits have the same TV taste. That's so funny. And they love Bob's Burgers. And another animated show that right? I'm now evangelizing for. Yeah, I've, I've actually been a fan of this for a while. But um, one thing, and again, I think this is just partly, as as a TV critic, uh, there are certain shows that I just enjoy watching as a civilian, not because I have to write about them or mm-hmm. doing anything with them. And I'm actually re-watching the whole run on Hulu. Uh, with my 15-year-old son, and it's just a, you know, it's like a classic, brilliant, quirky family comedy about a family that runs a burger restaurant, um, and like just a, a great de-stressing, you know, corrective to a day of exposing, you know, <laughs> my brain to like the poison <laughs> of the impeachment hearings or whatever. <laughs> uh, yeah, so. Okay, and number five. And number five, the probably my most sentimentally prized possession, my Epiphone FT-85 Serenader acoustic 12-string guitar. Wow. Being Jim. able Being able to give you all those details makes me sound like I'm like, you know, a really badass guitar player, and I'm not. I'm not that good at playing it. But uh, it's 12 strings. That's th- that's a beautiful sound. Well, I, it is gorgeous. Well, and that's the thing. Like, it's just, you know, even if you're not that great, you have that, that doubled, you know, octave sound that just makes it sound that much more beautiful. They sound gorgeous. Actually, I bought it back in college, 
and it was the 80s and it's sort of like you know the the rem jangly you mm-hmm. know indie rock era so right. you know, i was especially attracted to it at the time but um it's just it's just it's it's a gorgeous sound and even though you know i mostly am simply able to play chords you know it, in the bigger sense, I th- I just think I've always felt music is kind of the greatest form of art. And I think it's hugely therapeutic for anybody to be able to play a little bit of anything on any instrument, even if you're terrible at it. Uh, so, you know, and, and, and that's that's mine. That's my thing. That is really a great list. And it, it really fleshes out what your life is like when you're not watching TV. Uh, yeah, yeah. Sometimes when I am watching TV, the guitar is actually in in my office with me. So, uh, <laughs> so you can. Sometimes I'll just strum along. Oh, very nice, like a like a rim shot. Yeah. <laughs> and now my five things. Number one, I now find it kind of interesting to talk about cooking and recipes. This is new for me, but uh, kind of delightful and. Every time I talk to somebody about food and recipes, salt comes up as the secret ingredient. It's not a secret to me. It's my favorite thing. Number two, walking through Central Park. I used to think crossing the park on foot was a Herculean task that took half a day, but that is just wrong thinking, and I love it, and it helps clear my head. Number three, I go to exercise at a little Pilates and gyrotonic studio right near my house. The teachers are fantastic. They're all dancers, and it is also just great for my head and my body. Number four, Adam Schiff. Number five, and there'll be a sound effect, Nancy Pelosi. Jim Ponowazic. Audience of One, Donald Trump, Television, and the Fracturing of America. Read it before we go into a civil war. Thank you so much for being on the program. Oh, thanks so much for having me. You've been listening to Five Things That Make Life Better with me, Lisa Birnbach. My guest this week has been James Ponowazic, the New York Times chief television critic and author of Audience of One, Donald Trump Television and the Fracturing of America, published by Liverite Publishing. It is a good book. You can follow James on Twitter at Ponowazic. You can subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play Music, YouTube, and iHeartRadio. My blog is at lisabernbach.com, where you'll find links and photos to all the things in this program and my blog and a longer explanation of my five things. I don't want to leave them out, but I don't want to assume that people who are listening are also reading and vice versa. This podcast is produced in New York City by thefieldtv.com. My engineer is Kevin Watkins. My team is Spressa Orucci, Michael Port, Boko Haft, and Sam Haft. Until next week, stay warm and act natural. Bye-bye. That was Five Things with Lisa Bernbach. New episodes every Friday, if she remembers. <laughs> <laughs>